This will be part four of my gravity series. We started with centrifugal force, or why we don't fly off the spinning ball. Next, we talked about how density is not a force, but density is an important factor in buoyancy. Then we took a look at a particular notion called universal acceleration. In that third video, I introduced an experiment that famously separates Newton's law of gravitation from the other concepts we've evaluated. The so-called Cavendish experiment is significant enough to deserve its own video. Newton's law of gravity says that all masses attract each other, but is there a way to test for that? The setup is pretty straightforward. One hangs a beam with masses on each end from a very thin torsion rod. The beam can twist and the thin torsion rod offers only the slightest of resistance. The beam is allowed to settle and then another pair of masses is introduced. If the masses attract each other, it could be enough to make the torsion rod twist slightly. Even though it isn't relevant, I'll point out that it was not Cavendish's intention to prove Newton's law of gravity with this experiment at all. He accepted Newton's law based on the motion of the planets. He was applying Newton's law to measure the density of the Earth. However, because his experiment was successful, the implications are quite striking. The masses did attract each other, and most of us consider this independent validation of Newton's law of gravity. Legitimate scientific evidence must be repeatable, and this test certainly is. There are lots of examples of people building simple Cavendish rigs at home to test it themselves. There are many similar videos all over YouTube, and it must be noted that most of them are not very precise. Some of them were unable to reproduce the result at all. The gravitational constant is incredibly small, and that makes this experiment vulnerable to all sorts of confounding variables. The most obvious problem is wind. With such an incredibly sensitive instrument, any tiny air current can throw the whole thing off. Sometimes you'll hear the claim that the whole thing is fake, or at best inconclusive because of these failed experiments. But that's not entirely honest, is it? If you want to run an experiment like this yourself, there are some confounding variables to be aware of. And when you're evaluating the various homegrown experiments, you can tell which ones are the reliable ones because they've taken steps to deal with this. Here's a student performing the experiment with a commercially available rig. He gets extremely reliable results. And as you can see, the key is that this device has the torsion assembly isolated from any air currents behind a plastic panel. Here's another example of one of these commercially available devices. If you want to repeat this experiment yourself, I would suggest picking one of these up. I found one on Amazon for under $1,000. That's still more than I'd normally want to spend, but to prove something as earth-shattering as gravity being fake, that would be a tiny investment. If you prefer to go the home-built route, I strongly suggest using this same wind isolation technique. Most people try to enclose the entire rig, but the key is to isolate the torsion assembly to keep it away from any air currents the test masses might cause. You don't need to block the wind from the external test masses. What you want is a barrier between the external masses and the rotating arm. Another legitimate issue with this test is the effect of static electricity. You need to deal with this by making sure to ground the entire assembly. And I would strongly suggest a wire mesh as part of your isolation strategy. Watch as this professor from MIT demonstrates the remarkable impact of the wire mesh. As you can see, many schools have these devices already, and anybody can simply buy one from Amazon. Having seen that, I was surprised at how little modern footage there was of this on YouTube. I contacted the university nearest to me to ask if they had one of these, and I was told that they used to, but they got rid of it. The professor told me that the experiment just isn't very exciting to physics students. The videos I've shown here have been sped up to make the effect noticeable at all. So in the classroom, it's downright boring. Besides, in a university physics class, the students all know how gravity works already. For some reason, you just don't see many flat earthers in a university physics class.
Having seen this, most of us would agree that the experiment clearly demonstrated an attraction between the various masses. We now know that careful laboratories have eliminated air currents as well as static electricity. The deniers tend to lean on magnetism next. Lead is attracting lead due to some tiny magnetic effect, they'll say. Well, then just swap out the test masses for something else. In this case, we had sand attracting water. At this point, the deniers are generally left with their old standby. Nuh-uh. They'll insist that the experiments were all faked or erroneous. My video on the Flat Earth Society actually attracted some engagement from somebody who accused me of dishonesty. The issue has to do with the scandal with the modern measurement of Big G. The FES claims that inaccuracies in the measurement of Big G are so large that we must discount the effect altogether. But I disagree. Let's take a closer look at that. What I've done here is I've gone through several gravity experiments that have been done over the years, and I've plotted their results along with their stated error in Excel and then made a chart out of it. These blue dots represent the year when the experiment was done and their, their experimental value for big G. And this black bars represent the stated margin of error that the original experimenter claimed. As you can see, uh, they have varied a little bit over the years. I've dropped a red line through the modern accepted value of big G. So for example, we look here and back in 1930, this was the number that the laboratory came up with, and they said that their margin of error was this big. And that, yeah, that encompasses the current value of big G. So we say, yeah, that's, that's cool, that, that's legit. But then look over here. The problem is right here, where we have this experiment and this experiment. The error bars for these experiments do not encompass the accepted value. And that's kind of a problem, but worse than that, the error bars for the experiments do not overlap. That tells us there's no possible way for all of these experiments to have been correct. At least some of these must be in error. That is the scandal that we're talking about. So what's the honest thing to do? Shall we throw out all of these experiments and declare the effect is non-existent? Before we do that, let's put this into perspective. The values quoted here vary by almost 800 parts per million. But what is the value the deniers want us to accept? They want us to believe that the correct value is zero. Where is zero on this chart? Let's see. Uh, this chart doesn't go down to zero. So let's fix that. Let's take a look at that. Here we go. I will just change the axis format to force it to include zero. That ought to do it. And now this is where this is where zero is on this chart. This is where our, our values were. Let's adjust this red line that shows the accepted value. That's right there. And now we see what we're really talking about. This huge scandal that we're talking about is the error bars on these blue dots do not overlap. Well, where are those error bars? They were there a second ago. Why can't we see them now? At this scale, those scandalous errors don't even show up. So now, tell me how those blue dots vary so wildly that we must reject them all. Look at this graph and tell me again how the correct value for big G should be zero?